my sense of writing is that it has not has to be and again in a moral is a moral issue but my sense of writing is that it must be viable it has it has to be uh, open to all that can confront it uh, if I wanted a sense of my life that uh, that I could offer is something I actually believe in I I want to be ready to go at any moment uh, I remember one time back in college going into Hayes Bickford there in Harvard Square with a friend a very nice man and um, Everybody's sitting around drinking coffee. It's sort of the end of the evening of drinking. Everybody's now coming to Hayes Victor to have a cup of coffee before they stagger home. And suddenly in the doorway appeared some man who said, who wants to go to Alaska? And this friend said, I'll go. And he went, I remember. And that impressed me, you know. I thought, not that one has to go so randomly to wherever is offered as a possibility of being, but I want poetry to be as as open to whatever can confront it as, 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 as something to be felt said. I want it to be free from proposals that say it must go this way, it must go that way, but I want it to be as sensitive to the intimate occasion as it can possibly be. The Immoral Proposition. If you never do anything for anyone else, you are spared the tragedy of human relationships. If quietly and like another time, there is the passage of an unexpected thing. To look at it is more than it was. God knows nothing is competent, nothing is all there is. The unsure egoist is not good for himself. Robert Creeley is one of that community of poets whose names are associated with Black Mountain College in North Carolina, where he was a student and later a staff member during the middle and late 1950s. Currently, Robert Creeley, his wife Bobby, and their two young daughters live in the small town of Placitas, New Mexico. For the past several years, Creeley has been a lecturer in the English department at the University of New Mexico in nearby Albuquerque. Robert Creeley is a novelist and a short story writer as well as a poet, and few poets are more direct and articulate than Creeley in acknowledging literary influences. In particular, Creeley pays homage to William Carlos Williams, Robert Duncan, and Charles Olson. I move against a resistance, uh, which is so complex that I've never, never relaxedly even understood what it actually was proposing. Something in me seems to uh, uh, question the possibility of any statement. I don't, I don't. I've said it uh, in, in simple ways. That was, I've, I've attributed it, like they say, to the, uh, to the, to, to the circumstance of an England upbringing. But I don't think it's that simple. It's the question of being the last to speak in a family that was highly verbal, although it had no reference to literary matters, but it was a highly articulate family. Women talk and talk and talk. <laughs> <laughs> in the kitchen, I can remember these women talking and talking. No, my, my last left home, I remember, when I was about eight, when I left home, I was about 14 to go you to school. You always meant to say the last word, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> I even, you know, really even editing the selected writings of Charles Olson for New Directions, I have a, at the very end a last word, <laughs> which is sort of hard to get on Charles, you know. <laughs> Le Fou. This was the title poem of the first book of poems I ever had for Charles Olson, who plots then the lines, talking, taking, always the beat from the breath, moving slowly at first, the breath, which is slow. I mean, graces come slowly, it is that way. So slowly, they are waving, we are moving away from the trees, the usual, go by, which is slower than this, is we are moving, goodbye. Wilson, it was kind of a delight in that early sense because he showed me all this, uh, variety of movement that was possible simply uh, that you didn't have to worry about it. I mean, you simply, you said it. He was trying to, to show me uh, how it was that one might get hold of, say, structure in, in, in poetry. As, in other words, in a sense, apart from laying on some, some, some formal necessity that really didn't have to do with the given instant in which you were writing. Uh, he explained to me, for example, I was trying to use a line akin to Stevens's. This is the one that I, wa I wanted to think in the poem. I, Williams at some point says, the poet thinks with his poem 
in that lies his thought, and that is the profundity. Williams was always being accused of being not profound. He didn't. So uh, he said, well, look, I'm, this, this poem is actually the structure of my thought, and that's, that's what's profound. The mind in that evidence is, is the profundity of the actual activity. Uh, Wilson said, look, you're, you're, you're trying a line here that's not intimate with the way you're saying things. Uh, in other words, you're trying to pace this line in a very even and, and, and formal manner, but you're thinking in short verse. In other words, your thinking is long-winded, but your speaking is short and, and, and tends to, to follow a clusters of emphases in bursts. So why not try to get, a, to get hold of a way of saying it in the line that is intimate to this way of speaking? This, this, uh, these poems all then come from a, um, from what Olson had curiously made, made evident, or had actually made evident to me in these, in lining or finding a use of the line that could articulate the particular, particular rhythms of what was being felt in, in, in saying something, and then as that began to be more and more possible, then of course the, then I had further variations on on that fact, and uh, and the kind of thing I, I have to insist upon that I was hearing in Charlie Parker particularly, the kinds of emphasis and, and variation that he, he could get with accent. The very simple way he would, he would, he would come into, a, you know, come in, say, two beats or two, you know, two beats behind the initial, would simply replace the whole circumstance of what, what he was playing by putting it in a different place. The whip. I spent a night turning in bed. My love was a feather, a flat, sleeping thing. She was very white and quiet, and above us on the roof there was another woman I also loved, had addressed myself to in a fit. She returned. That encompasses it, but now I was lonely. I yelled, but what is that? Ugh, she said beside me. She put her hand on my back, for which act I think to say this wrongly. There are several. There's another one, very short from that same circumstance, La Noche. In the courtyard at midnight, at midnight, the moon is locked in itself to a man, a familiar thing. Things tend to come in clusters for me. Uh, that is, they come almost, you might say, it's not stupidly, they're like litters, or they come in, in cluster, so that literally in writing there'll be a point where, say, I'll be writing three or four or five poems a day at this, at least of this usual length. And they'll come in a, in a sitting, so to speak. And they tend to come seasonally, you know, which is pleasant. They come in the spring, they come in the fall, and sometimes they trail through the winter, but they rarely come in the summer. The summer is either, I'm, you know, one's so relaxed, who can bother to be <laughs> this disturbed? <laughs> or about anything. <coughs> but they tend, uh, but that particular group, that is, that first part of this book really is insistently dealing with this kind of um, rhythm. Like, underneath the grass on some soft grass I sat, I watched too happy woodpeckers be disturbed by my presence, and why not, I thought to myself, why not? You know, it's always sort of like they say, that one's called. I was, and I, I'm awfully worried at times about getting involved with habits that then become intolerable or limiting and binding, can't, can't break out of them. So that the language shifts. These now are poems that move into times of living in New Mexico after the whole, I mean, after the whole concern of the first part of the book has is, is, is been moved from. And again, Duncan, I feel, is very, very close to me in this time. The hero. Each voice which was asked spoke its words and heard more than that, the fair question, the onerous burden of the asking. And so the hero, the hero, stepped that gracefully into his redemption, losing or gaining life thereby. Now we, now I, ask also, and burdened, tied down, return and seek the forest also. Go forth, go forth, saith the grandmother, the fire of that old form and turns away from the form. And the forest is dark, mist hides it, trees are dim, but I turn to my father in the dark. A spark, that spark of hope, which was burnt out long ago, the tedious echo of the father image, which only women bear, also wear old men 
old cares and turn and again find the disorder in the mind. Night is dark like the mind. My mind is dark like the night. Oh, light the light, old foibles of the right. Into that pit, now pit of anywhere, the tears upon your hands. How can you stand it? I also turn. I wear the face. I face the right, the night, the way. I go along the path into the last and only dark, hearing hero, hero, a voice faint enough, a spark, a glimmer grown dimmer through years of old, old fears. It's a strange one, you see, because it doesn't come, it doesn't come from, from senses of things that I'm very familiar with, although then you see what you're saying about what does one get, or what do you have as knowledge, what does one have as knowledge of what, you're, what one's writing is. Well, see, I begin to realize as I get older, so to speak, and have then, you know, this much back of me in this sense, that they're very, forest, for example, is a very, is a very continual reference. But see here, for example, not stupidly, but here in the next page is another poem called The Traveler, Into the Forest Again, Whence All Roads Depend, This Way and That, To Lead Him Back. Upon his shoulders, he places boulders. Upon his eye, the high, wide sky. Now, boulders is a New England word. I don't, you don't hear it frequently here. People don't speak of large stones as being boulders. But a boulder in a cow pasture in New England is a very real weight. <laughs> Climb on and they said, to me it was the real mass of things was somehow the boulders, you know. The whole, the whole sense of, um, where I came from, so to speak, is is for me New England. The whole uh, New England during the 30s, a small town, uh, about 20 miles, I think, uh, north of Boston, Acton, West Acton, just this other side of Concord, which was always a, uh, I mean, one was almost there, but not quite. But the whole sense of that river, the Concord River, and the uh, bushlands, high woods. And, but at that time, it was still a small farming town. And uh, the distance to Boston, I was talking to John Wieners, uh, and the distance to Boston was very large. And now it's simply a suburb. It's changed completely the whole uh, for that place. Anyhow, growing up, my father died when I was very young. And had moved out to this part of the Massachusetts uh, to have a sort of house away from the city. He was a doctor and uh, worked mainly in uh, Watertown. And was a consulting physician for the Children's Hospital and also for the uh, Sims Arlington Hospital in, in, in Arlington. And then uh, he died and we lived on in this house and my mother, to support us, uh, was a public health nurse and worked at that job for all her life, really. But it was very odd living in this large house that became uh, more and more empty. <laughs> I got a scholarship to Holderness uh, in Plymouth and went there, and then was very. Then, when I was 18, I decided. Uh, oh, I didn't decide. I had I had several teachers I liked very much, and I was very inarticulate. I loved to talk, but I was very uh, unable to say what it was I was wanting to say. And uh, these particular teachers were very attractive to me in the, in, in, in the way they said things. And I remember the very last minute, after, as I was graduating, I had to make a decision about what I was going to do. And at that time, I was very interested to be a vet. I wanted to, I loved animals. And um, I had a scholarship, I remember, to the University of Pennsylvania and to Amherst. And I had been admitted to Harvard. <laughs> so, uh, but Harvard was, so to speak, the great literary tradition. And the University of Pennsylvania, I was too ignorant to realize that would have been the most, you know, significant tradition, etc. But in any case, uh, I decided then I was going to be a writer. So I went to, I went to Harvard. and experienced absolute frustration for whatever time I was there. Um, at the same time, I was like a living real life, I thought, you know, drinking a lot of beer and things like that. And one evening, we got very drunk, uh, some friends and myself, and we took a door from the entrance to Lowell House and to see if we could carry it. And whereupon we were caught by this particular college policeman. And the next thing I know, I was suspended for uh, stealing university property. And uh, so then I had to do something. Then I had to prove I was serious. So uh, I went into the American Field Service. <coughs> I 
I don't know. So my mother give, giving me a lunch is like <laughs> left and went to Baltimore and got a got a freighter to uh, with another man I much cared for, John Forbes Amory, uh, who'd been in the first war. And the two of us made our way to uh, Bombay. And at the first night in Green's Hotel in Bombay, uh, I had was was using an artificial eye, a glass eye that I'd had is uh, worn ever since I'd lost my eye when I was a kid. Also, I was about four. And a sweeper came into the room to sort of tidy things up. And I remember him, I remember watching in this kind of horrified respect as he simply swept this eye right onto the floor, you know, <laughs> whereupon it broke. And um, that was, that was so, it was so simple that this could be it, you know, you could really deal with this thing so, so casually. And then I said, what am I going to do? In other words, there's my, my eye is lying broken on the floor. So uh, I went to the various medical, you know, British and American medical uh, people. And finally, it, it, it turned out that uh, the only way I could replace that eye was to go to England, uh, which would take about three months, what was priorities. And uh, so I had to make a decision as to whether or not I really needed that that much, because the doctors told me if, I, if you don't wear it, you're going to have a problem with the, with the socket closing. And I don't know, that eye had dogged me for a long time. It was something I had to take care of and, and, and had to, uh, I mean, I had to propose it to people as, as real, and it always had been awkward for me. So I decided then not, not, to, not to wear it further and uh, started wearing a patch, which I wore for some years until finally we were living in France and the, the fact that so many people at that time in France were, were, had been hurt in the war or something, and there was no, absolutely no interest in, in whether one had one eye or two eyes or a missing hand or fingers or whatever. It was very, very common. So I stopped uh, wearing uh, anything. And uh, I, was, I, I was concerned to have myself, <laughs> I was concerned to have myself present as I actually felt I was. I, I, I've been awfully, again, that New England background is awfully leery of any proposal that isn't distinctly the, the, the actual person that's involved. The first time, we are given a chance among the worst something left otherwise hopeful circumstance. As I spoke to you once, I loved you as simply as that. Now to go back, I cannot, but going on will not forget the first time. You likewise with me must be testament to pain's indifference. We are only careful for such a memory, more careful, I think, than we ever thought to be. I've had the sense that I've worn out certain kinds of focus, or rather a focus on certain kinds of relationship uh, no longer yields to me much of, uh, of any occasion that's, you know, that's involved with these, with these poems. That is, for a long time, I, I really stayed very centered on that issue of how does a man live with a woman and vice versa? I mean, that literally was to me the, the most, you know, the most deep and the most, the most insistent sense of problem, or at least that was the question I had in my mind perhaps for 20 years without, without relief. And then, um, happily, <laughs> happily, it's no longer that kind of question. So that this now moves into another possibility of, uh, now I'm beginning to, to, to experience the sense of being alive as something curiously physical and, and finite, and uh, now I'm much more involved with senses of relationship in a, I wouldn't say in a more extensive pattern, or in, in, in a larger, perhaps, range, I don't think that's the point, but it's uh, different states of feeling as it, in different points of uh, one's experience of one's own life. I mean, now, I was trying to get out in those days, so to speak. These poems, to me, are much involved with trying to get out of a particular seizure or fix this is the place. Bobby and I had gone down to Juarez, remember, for New Year's. And there was a little uh, cafe uh, restaurant, uh, like a pavilion, you know, with little trees, and but no one there at all. It was sort of sat in this lovely sort of empty grandeur, which was all sort of faded, and, and it was a lovely. The place. What is the form is the grotesquerie, the accident, of the moon's light on your face. O oh, love 
an empty table, an empty bottle also, but no trick will go so far, but not further. The end of the year is a division, a drunken derision of composition's accident. We both fell, I fell, you fell. In hell we will tell of it. Forms accidents, we move backwards to love. The movement of the sentence tells me of you as it was the bottle we drank. No, it was no accident. Ach, form is what happens. Form is an accompaniment. I to love, you to love. Syntactic accident. It will all come true in a year. The empty bottle, the empty table tell where we were. I like that. Yeah. For love, for Bobby. Yesterday I wanted to speak of it, that sense above the others to me, important because all that I know derives from what it teaches me. Today, what is it that is finally so helpless, different, despairs of its own statement, wants to turn away endlessly, to turn away? If the moon did not, no, if you did not, I wouldn't either, but what would I not do? What prevention, what thing so quickly stopped? That is love yesterday or tomorrow, not now. Can I eat what you give me? I have not earned it. Must I think of everything as earned? Now love also becomes a reward so remote from me I have only made it with my mind. Here is tedium, despair, a painful sense of isolation and whimsical, if pompous, self-regard. But that image is only of the mind's vague structure, vague to me because it is my own. Love, what do I think to say? I cannot say it. What have you become to ask? What have I made you into? Companion, good company, crossed legs with skirt, or soft body under the bones of the bed. Nothing says anything but that which it wishes would come true, fears what else might happen in some other place, some other time, not this one, a voice in my place, an echo of that only in yours. Let me, let me stumble into, not the confession, but the obsession I begin with now, for you, also, also, some time beyond place, or place beyond time, no mind left to say anything at all, that face gone now, into the company of love, it all returns. The major collection of Robert Creeley's work to date is in the volume For Love, poems 1950 to 1960, published by Charles Scribner's Sons. His novel, The Island, was issued by the same publisher in 1963, and in 1966, his collection of stories, The Gold Diggers. A new collection of poems will be published early in 1967. Creeley's lectures on poetry and his readings are very popular with college students, and he is very much in demand on the university poetry reading circuit. This past year, he has traveled extensively throughout the United States, and at the time that this film was made, he and his wife were about to leave for Italy on a writing grant. We fly to England. Well, we fly to England. But then I asked, uh, what's his name about that? You know, and he said, it turns out there are a lot of... I said, why can't we bring the children? You know, he said, well... I said, is it really that question, as he said in his letter, or on the phone, the, the well, rocky well, high places well, that you're going to... Well, he said that there are old gentlemen, in, in, in effect, in residence in this place, who feel that the children created... Uh, you know, a disturbance at breakfast or something like that. I thought, holy oh, God. Somebody do. That's a European accent. I hate what that. What are you going to do with the children? That's sort of my answer. We'll leave them with their grandmother. <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> I mean, I love a breakfast with our children. I love children. Yeah, right. Yeah. My dear. Isn't there a place in there? Right? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <laughs> what do you think you're here for? <laughs> Just to sit around? <laughs> no. Oh, whither thou goest. <laughs> no, I th yeah, what would you like? To I can quote them all by, you know, from memory. Reading 12 times in the last <laughs> two weeks. 
If you get tired of the sense of the poem, you get tired of the quote meaning, after you've read it a dozen times, it doesn't have that possibility. So I don't know. What, what should I read? Come on. Order. Neat. I don't know. What would you like to hear? Open it at random. Give a minute. This is apropos this house. <coughs> Some place. I resolved it. I found in my life a center and secured it. It is the house, trees beyond, a term of view encasing it. The weather reaches only as some wind, a little deadened sighing, and if the life weren't, when was something to happen? Had I secured that? Had I had I insisted? There is nothing I am, nothing not, a place between I am. I am more than thought, less than thought, a house with winds, but a distance, something loose in the wind, feeling whether is that life walks toward the lights he left. Walking. In my head I am walking, but I am not in my head. Where is there to walk, not thought of? Is the road itself more than seen? I think it might be, feel as my feet do, and continue, and at last reach, slowly, one end of my intention. Lately, let's say in the last two months or three months, since about the end of the winter, or at least the end of the severe, severe part of the winter, I've been dreaming and having uh, premonitions and senses of, 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 of uh, statement or of kinds of concern that become very insistent. Although now I'm embarrassed to even say what they are, but they keep, you know, they keep occurring, and they keep, you know, times when you're tired or you know, and just about to go to sleep or, or still, you know, distracted by something, but still these things come insistently in. And um, I, I trust the sense that Duncan made clear once in speaking of senses of writing. He said it's like if you feel a kind of readiness for it. It's like having a feeling that you want to take a walk. You don't know literally where you're going. You don't know what actual purpose of any order is involved, but you, you feel a kind of restlessness and, and, and as he puts it, a readiness for, 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 for beginning to do this thing. And that's where I feel now in my own circumstance. Words. You are always with me. There is never a separate place. But if in the twisted place I cannot speak, not indulgence or fear only, but a tongue rotten with what it tastes, there is a memory of water, of food when hungry. Some day will not be this one then to say words like a clear, fine ash sifts like dust from nowhere. This is NET, the National Educational Television Network.